Today, I want to tell you a tale from a time when the world was reeling, an era of a bombardment of the senses, when our hero, benefiting from privilege of one sense or another, was suddenly thrust outside the palace walls, and although slightly conscious at the time, discovered a gaping crack of inequity in his ivory tower. It's a tale of a journey into a world when everything was laid bare. And our hero, although already woke to some degree, experienced as if for the first time sorrow, pain, suffering, and injustice, even if that not of his own, but that of his sisters and brothers, family, uh, that of politics, environment, principles and policies sound familiar? <laughs> well, it should, from our own collective COVID haze. But this is a tale from yesteryear, ever the more relevant for tomorrow's journey. Join me. We've all been on a journey of sorts these days, and hopefully this channel has been a positive support for that process. If so, take a moment now to like, comment, share, subscribe even. That would be great. But now, back to our story. Inasmuch as things seem unreal these days, there's a compounding sense of familiarity, if you would, almost like a deja vu all over again. Almost like a deja vu all over again. Phil? Phil? Phil Connors? Phil Connors, I thought that was you. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for watching. A hey. visual imagery that seems pulled from movies and favorite TV programs. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon uncomfortably reminiscent historical themes, too. Our story begins, as these stories often do, with a young up-and-coming politician. He's a deeply religious man and a member of the Conservative Party. He's completely single-minded and has no regard for the political process. The more power he attains, the more obvious his zealotry, and the more aggressive his supporters become. With lessons to be learned from troubles not that long ago. Scientists at the National Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. No doubt it's left us all questioning things in our life, maybe even reality itself. Submitted for your approval, a journey inward, searching for answers, meaning self-identity as we travel through the pandemic zone. So I decided I would seek out some answers, or at least some level of balance. I referred to my own travels and my own digital files from a time before COVID when I traveled beyond my own protected palace walls to gain perspective. My destiny, Nepal, a 21-hour flight from New York. It's where Raiders of the Lost Ark all started. Unlike Indiana Jones, I was headed to Nepal with all my gear for a little adventure of my own. And maybe meet up with Karen Allen, the actress, you know, who played Marion Ravenwood. On my long and unpleasant flight, I dreamt I'd walk into her bar. Reminder of that time we walked through Central Park together on that fine fall day. And maybe rekindle our... <laughs> Ouch. Ah, oh, okay, I guess that's a no. <laughs> well, ladies, that leaves me free and clear, I suppose. Well, at least to pursue a higher purpose while visiting this amazing country. And in truth, I was in Nepal to film American adventurer Bill Burke. He is the oldest American to climb Mount Everest from both sides, and certainly one of the most unassumingly cool guys I ever met. The link to his website and YouTube is above. You can check out his adventures there. I followed him to Nepal to chronicle his climbing of a mountain. Well, his mountain. Named in his honor. Bark, meaning his family name, and Kong, meaning mountain in the local language. 
the journey was very much real, but in some ways it was deeply allegorical. I mean, don't we all have a mountain to climb or try to? And with whatever I was going through at the time, I had convinced myself that I was this lone climber blazing a trail no one else had ever gone through. So Nepal serves as the setting for today's story and to introduce you to the real hero of our story today, Siddhartha. He was born in the Lumbini province of Nepal, the child of an aristocratic family of the Shakya clan. So when I say he lived like a prince, I really mean it. And although he had no worries, he did have a sense of wanderlust and adventure to discover what was beyond his palace walls. And who could blame him? Prince Siddhartha was born 2,600 years ago in Nepal. Okay, now that's a bit hard for us Americans to fathom because we only go back about 200 years or so. And let's face it, we have a habit of uh, trying to forget our past. Well, let's put it into perspective. That would be 600 years before Christianity. Our hero Sid was raised in a place called Kapilavastu, which extends across the present India-Nepal border. But his journey to find his true calling didn't start until he ventured out into the real world. And it was this experience that ultimately led him to sit beneath the Bodhi tree for 49 days and become enlightened and reborn as Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. No, 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 not as in a member of the Wu-Tang Clan, although they did drop some pretty deep beats that were probably one form of meditation or another. Why is the sky blue? Why is water wet? Why did Judas rat the Romans while Jesus But our boy Sid lived a slightly more idyllic life, at least for the first 29 years of it, when he was sheltered behind the palace walls by his father. His journey really began when he went past those walls and into the real world. At that point, he discovered sickness and poverty and social inequality. Wait, this is starting to sound like a Wu-Tang Clan. Stand back, this white boy might start rapping. Buddhism then ultimately spread throughout the East through the Silk Road. It was an ancient trade route linking China with the West. No, not that West. We didn't even exist yet. But rather other great civilizations like Rome. Silk went westward from Asia. Wool's gold and silver went east. China also ultimately received Christianity as well as Buddhism, all via the Silk Road. And as such, temples popped up along the way to protect the many travelers. A lot like what I experienced during my trek in the Himalayas, moving from Kathmandu towards Everest and base camp for Burke Khan. Let's run this down for us Westerners. Buddhism is not to be confused with Confucianism, which is a philosophy created by a Chinese philosopher named Confucius. Well, that's confounding. Nor should it be confused with Taoism, which is confusingly pronounced Taoism, like it has a D, which is a Chinese philosophy based on the writings of Lao Tzu. Now, the Wu-Tang clan, not Buddhist, drew from the Shaolin Kung Fu movies. Although those monks are Buddhist, to be sure, Westerners mostly celebrate their martial arts practice and miss the deep meditative centering practice of the art. There's, of course, Tibetan Buddhism, with the Dalai Lama at the head of that movement, currently living under exile from China. And to be clear, in Nepal, it's mostly a mix of Buddhism and Hinduism, which, unlike most other religions, has no single founder nor no single scripture. As to the Sherpa culture, often confused solely as schleppers from the non-local mountain climbers, they are basically the Nyingma, or Red Hat, sect of Tibetan Buddhism. But their practice is more of a mixture of Buddhism and something called animism, the belief objects and places all possess a distinct spiritual essence. This is not to be confused with animalism or annihilism, which is what most pessimists practice. If they were all gonna die. So Sherpas don't play. They pray, especially before a mountain climbing. Part of any good climb is asking for the blessing of the mountain gods. I learned a lot while hanging in Nepal with Bill. And unlike what I observed with a lot of other Westerners, uh, Western climbers to be specific, Bill really not only respects the culture, but he loves the people. And I think aptly demonstrates what Buddhists would call right view, which is one of the aspects of an eightfold path. So the Sherpa culture, most of the Sherpas, are in the, at least when you get into the mountains, are Buddhists. And they're deeply religious, they're deeply spiritual. You hear them, uh, 
uh, chanting uh, on their trek stop and and uh, so they're that's a very big part of their culture they're very peaceful spiritual people and when you when you look at the way they live and you look at the conditions in which the people live and their children it's very harsh it's very harsh they have very little and yet you always see a smile on their face the Himalayas can easily make one realize just how magnificent the world around us is, and therefore offer plenty examples of right view. Case in point, I got to see a rainbow over the Himalayas, which was something I didn't even know was on my bucket list. It was something I took home, not just in the memory, not just with my digital film, but in my heart. But the trip left me with a sense of, of heightened power, well, first of all, in the sense that physically I had done this and succeeded to get to base camp. And secondarily, mentally, because part of getting there, not just physically, was mentally telling myself at every hard moment, I could press on, I could do this. And I was surprised to see when I got back, it even changed my breathing capacity. It was deepened. It was stronger. But... It also did something else to me. It lit something inside me, and I couldn't describe it. I couldn't explain it, and I mistakenly took it for a wanderlust desire, a sense to explore and travel, and that's exactly what I did. I kept my things packed, and I just ventured forward, continuing to travel, to discover, to film, to move, to work. Before the year was out, I traveled to the majestic California coast under its glorious sun. I experienced the arid grandeur of the Nevada landscape, even the way it is vexed, as far as I'm concerned, by the man-made excesses of Vegas. I awoke to the brooding beauty and unrest of Budapest, still awakening from its oppressive past. Oh, and I swayed to the pure zeal and zest of Havana, Cuba, dancing vibrantly through the crumbling infrastructure of yesteryear. But wherever I went, there I was, wherever there was at the time. Where it wasn't was home, whatever that meant. See, my wife and I were already living separately in a mere technicality of a marriage, I suppose, and hung upon this concept that there was something out there unspoken, beyond our grasp, beyond our knowledge even, that might somehow manifest to fix our marriage. And as the man, I was supposed to venture out, find it, and bring it home. Home. I mean, this was the place I defined as where I had a life with my wife, where we raised our kids together. And suddenly, I had none. My daughter was off at college. My son was beginning the next stage of his life with the woman that I was pretty certain would become his wife. And suddenly, I had no place in home. It was told to me once that kids are lent to us as parents. We do not own them. They do not belong to us. They belong to the world. And we want to see them out there. But losing wife and kids all in one fell swoop left me very unready. So what did I do? I threw myself into my work, grabbing my camera, going on adventures, other people's adventures to tell other people's stories. And somewhere in the process, I not only lost home, I lost me. I traveled right up to the end of 2017, and once I came back, I found that I was still not here nor there. I would spend the rest of 2018 unpacking the digital assets that I had filmed at various places and unpacking the souvenirs, trying to connect again to them. But the better portion of my life remained unpacked. My sense of self, my, my value system, life as I knew it as a family man, even a desired career change or adjustment, all of it went unresolved until it could be ignored no longer. And then it came crashing down upon me. 
and I let it fall. I guess because somehow I knew that in order to process the something that was unsettled, even exposed within my travels, especially Nepal, that like our boy Siddhartha, I needed to sit and journey inside this time in order to find myself in the world and the pathway back home. I'm Jeff Oppenheim, and I thank you for joining me on this journey, and I hope you'll press like, share with a friend, drop a comment, and subscribe. I hope you'll stay tuned for more episodes on my journey towards Buddha.